much uh, for the Good morning, everyone. Uh, my Russian is not very good, so I'll stick to speaking English. Um, and hopefully, you'll get some translation. Uh, before I start, I would, um, on behalf of my colleagues, I'm sure, would like to finally thank um, Alexei and the director of this institute, um, Carl Stotts, and a few other friends that uh, made an effort really to persuade us to come to this wonderful city of Sibishan. Uh, uh, we are uh, thoroughly touched by the hospitality and openness of the people, so thank you very much before I start. Uh, I have been asked to um, give a talk about uh, a kind of personal perspective of how I saw the development of laparoscopic coronary surgery in my institute. Because six years ago, we were not very different to what Alexei had just described in terms of culture change um, and also in terms of infrastructure skill gap. So I thought it would be a good idea to share with you our experience of how we have gone in the last six years. Just give you an idea of this, um, how we have done it and hopefully to demonstrate that this is reproducible. This is not some kind of uh, magic which is done by common people like ourselves. I'm sure there are very special people in this world who make it in the center. Right. Uh, when I tell people I work in Portsmouth, they say, how far from London? So everybody knows London, nobody knows Portsmouth. So I thought um, I'd just use this map. The star really here is where Portsmouth is. So it is a coastal town. If you ever come to Portsmouth, uh, you will see some nice beaches. These are the best pictures of Portsmouth, obviously, that I've picked to show. If you are uh, interested in sailing, it's a good place to come. There is a lot of naval history in the town. And um, on a sunny day, if you don't seem to get very often in England, you can go on from a very nice view and sit down and have uh, a drink with a little look at This is uh, one of the Pelica uh, Tower, which is one of the landmark uh, towers in the town. Uh, it took a lot of money to build it. Initially called Millennium Tower, and then it was built in And there is this very famous ship of HMS Victory, which is a ship used in the Tumblr Mall, which is a station there now. These days you can go buy tickets, um, or you can go and have dinner or lunch on the ship. So it's a good place to come and visit. Uh, this is where I work. It's a uh, wheel like that on hospital. Um, it's quite a large hospital for a UK standard, 1200 beds, um, and then we look after a population of about 600,000 to 650,000 people around us. Um, we are one of the bowel cancer screening centers, so that has increased the workload in our department. And for the last four years or so, we became national center to train people in the clinic of the on a yearly basis, we discuss about 320 <coughs> cases of colorectal cancer in our MGT meeting, and we operate on about 240. This would be the perspective of my talk, really, and I thought I'd just talk about uh, lepsopic rectal cancer surgery. Um, Alexei has done uh, a beautiful presentation on uh, clinical evidence, so he's uh, saved a lot of slides for me, so I've deleted quite a few slides from various slides, which is good. Um, second half of uh, the presentation would be the, the development of colorectal surgery in Portsmouth, and then just um, a shared view of um, a force of practice for looking after people with colorectal cancer. Uh, I'm sure some of you would know this face. This is a uh, face of Professor Delhi. Um, some people would argue and consider that he perhaps was the father of total nasal excision surgery, uh, started in early 80s. Um, and um, I had the privilege of working in this unit uh, to see where the standard was before we actually started doing laparoscopic surgery. He is uh, still quite heavily involved in teaching and training, and he is one of the few people uh, who I got a lot of inspiration from because he brought a lot of change in the cancer surgery. 
So what is, uh, what did he achieve actually? Shortly to the decision of the concept uh, which was popularized in the early 1980s. And the idea really was to define a play uh, which he described as holy play. Uh, or holy play of LP, uh, as it is known as. And uh, the impact of the technique was that he not only demonstrated that he could reduce the local recurrence rate following cancer surgery, but it has a direct impact on long-term survival. But more importantly, which some people did not give him a lot of credit to begin with, he perhaps was the surgeon who recognized the issue of quality of life, i.e. nerve preservation, for better neurological function, better nerve preservation. Um, some bosses I worked for, um, they were contemporary of uh, Bill Eel, and they always used to say that we did the same operation. I don't know why he called it so special operation. But when I watched them do the operation, they actually were not doing the operation that Bill Eel described. So I think the important was that he recognized that defining um, the cancer margins, but more importantly, the nerve preservation has a huge impact on quality of life for people. Which is often something that we forget as they because we are more focused on cancer care. I would not bore you with a lot of data, so I will just put up uh, these two papers daily. Um, and one of the papers was a historical paper by Bill Neal, published in 1986, where they demonstrated under 4% local recurrence rate. Uh, and initially when this was published, um, like most things in life, whenever you come up with something out of ordinary, you always get blamed that you are perhaps lying and making the results up. So nobody believes it. And we went across um, to Scandinavia and trained surgeon there. And uh, to his um, credit, the surgeons in Scandinavia were able to reproduce the same results, giving him credibility. And we know the rest of the story uh, for now. Another paper looked at the uh, impact of surgical training program on surgery. Uh, this is a small home study which demonstrated, which I just said, this is supervised training under the same principle as this. And they did long term follow up after a home training that was this is possible. Now, I can stand here and give you lots of studies, individual series, potential randomized control trial to show that perhaps laparoscopic vector surgery is the uh, same or if not better as compared to open surgery. But the reality is that whoever has actually either seen or performed laparoscopic TME, they will know that this is the present. This is not the future, this is the present. We can stay to stay. And people who are in this room is going to laparoscopic surgery to learn it because that's where their careers would be directed to. I have put in uh, two large uh, papers from the literature, which uh, close to 600 uh, patients now, which demonstrated that it showed a similar short-term benefit, i.e. shorter hospital stay, better blood loss, less post-operative pain, early discharge, but more importantly, oncological um, at par, oncological equivalence to open surgery. Because most of us who are laparoscopic surgery, we often get quoted figures from classic trial, where there was 29% um, conversion rate and close to 25% circumferential dissection margin positivity rate. But what everybody forget is that people who were participating in the classic trial were learning the surgery themselves as they went along. So in order to be an expert to participate in classic trial, you should have done 20 cases, and that made you an expert. So if you look at some of the centers who participated in classic trial, and look at surgeons who, like Robin Kennedy or uh, Robin Watson, for example, if you look at their 10 years data following classic trial, their data is so much better, it demonstrates that they became good at what they did. And that is the true data, really, which people should be judging rather than the trial that happened in 1990. Uh, this is again um, uh, another um, study to demonstrate looking into the various learning patterns, how people learn quicker. Um, and again, an absolutely lesson section. This is a Korean study which demonstrates that it is possible to train people in a standardized way to meet these intellectual cancer results that we all know. So, what are the real challenges, really? 
if you look at um, three of challenges, it is radiotherapy presents a big challenge. I uh, locally advanced that tumor. People often use this um, argument that perhaps locally aggressive tumor are not suitable for laparoscopy. And radiotherapy does present a problem. The problem of uh, difficult access in male pelvis, as we all know, we also have difficulty with exposure, tissue infection, and then there's a question of the collateral damage using different energy sources like bipolar devices or multi-calcular or monopolar devices. Uh, male patients, I have mentioned, they are challenged. Then the bigger problem is the division of low rectum using the current stapler technology with multiple firing. And some people generally believe that multiple firing of stapling devices result into worse clinical leak rates. There is also, certainly in England, I'm not too sure this would apply in Russia, but there is something called peer pressure, where you are pressurized looking at your colleague. You know, I'm doing it, but he's not doing it. So you have to sort of get on and up the game, so to speak. And often people end up facing a problem of trying to do it too quickly. And I mentioned classic trials, which we all know. So these are so some of the challenges, if not all of the challenges. But things do have changed, you know, like you mentioned, things have changed from the uh, beginning of uh, laparoscopic surgery now. You, there are improvements in um, the PhD system, we are looking at much higher definition, you can almost uh, look at 3D regions now doing laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the fundamental point really for me is the second line of which is increased experience in laparoscopic colon surgery. As we all become better confident and more importantly, we start knowing our limitations, uh, we all became better in the lab, so we recommend this. Uh, there is enough published paper now from different centers to say that this is not a medical operation. Most centers can be introduced good results, which is also a testament that perhaps this is new. And now, in current climate, there is a talk of perhaps introducing robotic surgery to say that perhaps this would answer some of the technical difficulties in male pelvis. Um, I think this is a debate and I won't get into it, but this is here to stay as well. It's not going to be a hurry. So, what do we do in postman? Um, this is a um, uh, standardized of practice and uh, we do bar preparation, medical bar preparation for people who undergo uh, laparoscopic TME. Um, we mark them for stoma because they still need function. Uh, all of my volunteers mm -hmm. have And this is again a uh, topic for debate. Some people get very good results without the functioning. Um, we adopt the technique of what we call medium to vessel approach. Then we do the vessels, which are in the very artery and veins first before we actually go the And although we have a selective approach of mobilizing hepatic flexure, but inevitably, Almost in most cases, compared to low rectums, you end up mobilizing the flexure because you need a soft mass of those You need it's 4 to 4, 4 to 5 force technique, and uh, you can use of uh, different ways of doing it. This is what I meant by medium to lateral approach. Uh, it starts just under the inferior with the artery. Uh, in my reference, you use diathermy. The idea really is to do an operation behind the back of the femur and the artery. I use uh, standardized clips, uh, the plastic clips on the femur and the artery, proximal to the collect. And then you develop a plane, which is a plane at the front of the tall fascia, rotor fascia, you can see. Uh, this is uh, a very vascular plane because uh, you remove the embryological plane, often there is no bleeding. Take the higher, and then develop this plane to enter the lesser sac or at least identify pancreas to drop it, um, which is um, it's of taking it. Now you can leave a swab here, and the swab is sort of meant really to, um, to identify when you go on the top. Um, then you mobilize the left colon, you can use harmonic calcul, you can use anything, maybe I use that in the hook because it's easier. I use harmonic here because you're in the lesser side, often there is a first match. As you burn the lesser side here, you see your swab immediately, it is placed there to protect the pancreas. 
And then all you do is to take the, uh, the end down, which is just this direct connection joining this dot to the dot here. So you can see the swap at the bottom just there. Now this is the start of the TME, um, which is um, really um, the posterior plane we developed. Uh, I use, by preference, monopolar diatomic hook, uh, which is again at the back of superior rectal artery. Um, and then we progress the back first, leave the left side attached, because if you attach both sides, then the specimens start to rotate, and it becomes very confusing. So the best thing is to just use the back first. So you can see just here, there is here joining the back of the package. That's where the logical layers are. And at this point, you can go and write uh, from the side and make a cut as by doing the reflection. I do this at this stage because uh, I want to use this as a, a, a guide when I detach the left side to know where I have to arrive. Uh, again, it is really the section in this thin layer of hair that I'm interested in. You can use uh, other energy sources, but I generally believe that if you use something else, it tends to bring the planes together, fuse the plane together. So it gives you a good impression that this is not necessary. But often, you may go in and out of the plane without knowing it. One for a therapy is less forgiving, so if you get out of the plane, it would bleed. So at least you would know when you're wrong. In this stage, uh, both lines the left. Uh, left pillar now of the rectal package and if you see we already have done all that section the left pillar is running along this side and that's why I mark the front because then you know that it's going to go and join this layer to that layer and you don't end up going sideways. So that's why I marked the layer before to give you an idea. Uh, you can hitch the uterus, I use the same stitch and uh, pull the base of the bladder up. Um, and the idea really is um, that <coughs> The curtain would stay up so your assistant can work way down at the back of the prostate providing counterfection. I use the simple stitch there to pull this up and get you a better access to this. Uh, at this stage, um, the assistant would have a little budget in his hand who will provide a fixed counterfection. I have the diagonal reflection and the air in front of me just there, in fact, just there. Just touch and try to keep the generative spatia intact. Now I'm touching it once or twice, but you can keep it all intact uh, if you're very careful. Again, you can see that it is an uh, operation that needs good assistance to at least two senior assistants. So they are able to help you and provide just enough traction to not pull it too hard, otherwise, you'll be bleeding. And you can see that this is just there as you mobilize it. I've uh, just sort of touched the Ravidia Spatia once or twice, but you can keep it all in fact, this is a posterior tumor, so I knew that I'm touching it and I was not concerned about it. Um, and that's, uh, you, you can go all the way down to the pelvic floor, you can uh, combine the shaping devices, the pelvic floor coming up and so forth. So, I think, um, instead of, sort of showing you the whole video, that I'll skip because that would be um, I just want to sort of share with you the concept of rotating the hand using the same board. People worry about dividing low rectums uh, and hoping that uh, they would get multiple firing. You can do a pronation technique uh, and then divide it. You can see same patient right on the pelvic floor. And I aim to go into two firing from a start. I don't try to go in one because I know that if I go in one, you'll end up sort of leaving a little dog here and then, which you still have to go. And you can see that at this stage, you're doing, uh, the premium is being pushed up. And you do gentle PR and you do all sorts of things. You can use um, Ashlon stapler, you can use this stapler. Uh, in our hospital, we have this, so we use this. Again, you can see two filings right out of the pelvic floor. The important thing is that it has to be free at the back here. That's why people don't end up having two filings. And you can see how low it is. It's almost like a polo in an astrosis from the top. And the way to play it's there, that's about the same And you see the cut. The cut of the staple line is between 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So it's a straight cut, even using the, the right hand. Uh, 
I generally believe it is possible to do the laparoscopic DME in the same way as you do open surgery. Um, and the real challenge really is uh, to reproduce what the good open TME surgery is. So you're not there to reinvent the operation. You have got better tools to do it. Uh, so you can serve much easier. Right. Uh, this part of my presentation is about uh, force of practice. I'll just show you sort of some data quickly. I know that uh, servants don't want to see a lot of data, so I'll try to, to skim through uh, lots of data slides. Uh, do you remember this picture which I showed you, how my hospital looks now? It's quite a nice hospital, it's a big building and it's brand new. But when I came and uh, came for the interview, on the day of the interview, this is what Portsmouth Hospital looked like. Um, you know, when I came in, there were a lot of digging going on, they, I was not too sure where to go. And I really asked myself, that, do I really need to work here? Do I really want to work here? It did present uh, some challenges, it also had some strengths in the unit. The challenge really was that there was no infrastructure. There was some laparoscopy going on before me, but the chap who did the laparoscopy left by the time I got appointed. Um, so there was a lack of infrastructure. It needed to be a different culture to do things differently. The concept of um, a standardized team was not there. The board chair really was lacking. But the strength of the unit was that I had very good, very good sporting colleagues who wanted me to succeed. Um, one thing which I often say, and you could never beat, is the numbers. It's the number game in the end. I generally believe if you have much larger practice, you would get good at it. If you consistently do good practice over a longer period of time. So in almost, um, in, in a way, it presented to me as a completely blank canvas. So if you work hard, you can color it the way you would like it. Uh, this is a view of my theater when I started first year. Uh, we used to have um, one stack here and um, in the morning there used to be a uh, competition between emergency theatre and our theatre. Whoever would get to the stack first would do the laparoscopic operation. So my registrar used to come to the hospital at 7 o'clock in the morning to get this stack. And this is how we did it for the first eight months. From there it became like this in five years, six years ago um, of work. Now it looks like this. And then, remember that stack I showed you? Now we have uh, three OR1 theatres, and the fourth one is just going in. And last month, the administration has invested into a Da Vinci robot as well, and we need to start uh, robotic TME surgery from May. Uh, you're welcome to come to one of our May meetings, which I will give you some uh, information about. It. So things have changed, things do change. Uh, you just need to be a bit more perseverance, so and you need to sort of Become good at what you do and demonstrate that it's worth a change. I think that's the message. Um, just to give you some idea about uh, UK practice, because um, Alexei asked me to share with you the practices we have, how we look after patients. So, 34,000 patients get diagnosed, 10 to 20% of them and actually, despite all the big treatment and improvement, there is very little improvement in, in mortality rates in the last 50 years. 50% of them will die within five years being treated. Now, the government have come up with this concept of what we call two-week wait rule, which means to identify patients who are at the high risk of potentially having colorectal cancer, and the idea was to improve quality of care. Improve survival by avoiding delay, it's debatable, but this is the original concept. And the idea was to safely reduce <coughs> lower risk patients before everybody was sent in and the system was completely blocked. So the GPs were given guidelines to identify patients who were at a higher risk and send them in as two weeks waiting for them. And the concept is that as soon as the GP start the referral letter, the hospital has a duty to see this patient within two weeks of being referred. We have a duty to produce diagnosis within 31 days of the patient being referred to us and a total of 62 days from the date of referral to be able to complete the treatment. So this is the timeline um, in UK for management of colorectal cancer. If you uh, do not achieve your uh, targets, uh, you get what we call failed targets and just get penalty um, on those. So that's why it is in administration interest to, to drive us. 
So what are the urgent referral criteria really? The IGP have got this form, he look at uh, any of these and if any of these uh, columns get ticked, the patient can be sent in as two weeks. So you can either have a palpable rectal mass in the PR examination, uh, you can have a criteria where the patient is more than 40 years of age and presents a change in bowel habit and bleeding for more than six weeks. You can be 60 years bleeding with no anal symptoms or you can have change in bowel habits if you are more than 60 years or you can feel a mass or if you are iron deficiency anemia. So any of these criteria, if they are fulfilled, GP would take it and send it out as uh, a referral. Once they come to us, uh, this is uh, a standard uh, pre-operative sort of setup. Um, colonoscopy is performed in clinics. Most centers have got rigid proctoscopy or rigid sigmoidoscopy. In Portsmouth, we have flexible sigmoidoscopy in clinic, so everybody gets to do those. Uh, we do tumor biopsy still. We do CT scan of abdomen, pelvis, and chest as a standard staging scan. And in case of rectal cancer, we do MRI, which is the gold standard, uh, and incorporated with this is postnatal ultrasound now to better stage the lowermost tumor. Uh, so the idea really is, it is recommended to assess the depth of the tumor and lymph node status if available. After all this, the patient is sent to what we call MDT, which is multidisciplinary team meeting or tumor board. It consists of a number of people, it consists of pathologists, radiologist, it consists of uh, GI radiologist, it consists of medical oncologist, radiotherapist, surgeons, specialist nurses, stroma nurses, and in some units they have dedicated an East test to come and attend this. So it is a big meeting and, and, and it's a very busy place and this is what usually happens in the meeting. You, know, you have all these people who come to make big decisions and I think halfway through the meeting most people lose interest. This is how I see it as a surgeon, how the MDT look like today. And this is how I see myself as a surgeon who needs to come in from the sky and deliver the care. Because at the end of the day, it is down to surgeon who drives the care of the patient. So yes, this meeting is around you to give you advice, but you are held accountable for the results. In England now, they have started publishing the results of individual surgeon with names. So you would have your name in the national data set, which patient can see your leak rates, your mortality rates, uh, and your cancer positive rates. They start with mortality now, and it's not 30 days mortality, it's 91 days. So even if the patient goes home and dies of something else, he is your figure. So I'm not too sure if it's a very clever way of doing it, because people will become very defensive. Right. So for follow-up after surgery, uh, we tend to see them in four to six weeks after surgery when they gone home. And the idea is to make sure their bones have healed up, they know the histology, they have recovered from surgery. I see them every six months for the first two years, and then clinical examination is carried out. They get a CT scan at the end of first year and the end of second year, and they get a colonoscopy in second and fourth or fifth year of their follow-up. So in total. They get two colonoscopies and three CT scans in total of five years. From cancer follow-up, they can be safely discharged, but more often than not, units unit tend to keep patients for their own data and interest, so they keep coming and seeing the surgeon. So what the real question really is that what proportion of those cancers actually can be done laparoscopically? This was looked at uh, by uh, a paper which was, uh, I was co-author from Joe Somerset with Robin Kennedy, where he uh, produced the paper over 12 years of practice to say that actually you can do 90% uh, of your elective cancers laparoscopically if you are trained. Uh, this is very difficult to be used in some of the centers. Uh, this is what is happening in Portsmouth um, from 2006 onward. We really are doing um, less than 10% now of our elective cancers open operation and they often are patients with multivisceral dissections who need other specialties involvement uh, or uh, patients who are not fit for pneumoperitoneum based on um, anesthetic assessment clinic. So very few really get uh, open operation now, most of them would have intention to treat the basis. And I, I would like to sort of stand here and take all the credit because I'm a surgeon, I mean, we managed to do that. But the reality is 
uh, that it's the aspect of a team. So you need uh, a lot of people around you to make you look good. If you look at this picture, it looks very nice from, from a distance. But actually, if you start looking at a individual person and their job, what they're meant to do, this guy's job is just to hang on to his phone. He doesn't know what he looks like from a distance, but everybody is doing their little job. I believe in teamwork, but I always believe, I also believe in the fact that team needs to be told what to do. So you need to have good leadership quality to lead a team, to tell them what they need to do, to make you look good. And that's, that's what works in most cases. So you need good team, you need supportive colleagues around you, you know, people who would like to look like you. They are not my colleagues, by the way, they are just pictures from the internet. Uh, okay. So I just quickly show you two papers and then I finished because I know everybody's bored. Um, this is the paper we published in Annals of Surgery and um, we look at high risk patients rather than state found uh, patients at all and we looked at if laparoscopy could um, add any benefit to those high risk patients because the general idea was that if patients have got high risk, i.e. if they are more than 80 years of age, if they have T4 tumor, if they have BMI of more than 30, or if they have uh, post radiation, they present a very high risk and they are not suitable for laparoscopy. So we challenged that and we thought that we would look into this as a study and see if there is a real difference. So data was collected prospectively for two years between 2006 and 2008 and we looked at laparoscopic and open operations done collectively in our unit. And this is the high risk group, like I said to you. Uh, 80 years and about, they estimate 3 or 4 pre op radiation, methodologically proven T3 or T4 tumor. What we looked at, we looked at length of stay, readmission rate, major post op complication, re operation rate, and post operative mortality. So, what was the data like? So, this is the data, it looks very busy, but I just would like to point out to you that some set of features. In total, we did 424 um, cancers in two years. Out of those, 224 were done laparoscopically, 200 were done open. And these are the demographics of the cancer itself. You can see that although it was not a randomized controlled trial, but vast majority of figures match the percentages on each side. Uh, so it was a pretty sort of uh, uh, standardized group despite not having the randomization. So we took it further and looked at uh, high risk patients and you can see these are the high risk factors within those patients and then we excluded patients from the data 134 patients fulfilled the criteria for open high risk 144 146 patients for laparoscopic again similar number not so much difference really to compare like with like and it is important to present something where you could compare like with like so this was a comparison of outcome for us. I had um, quite a few slides. I'm happy to get this paper if anybody is interested in the reprints. But I just, in order for the presentation, I kept it really short. So we looked at um, median length of stay. You can see a laparoscopic high risk, four days, seven days. Readmission rate slightly higher in this group. Post-op mortality one. Post-operative complication requiring further uh, operation is again very small and very similar. And we looked at low risk patients, again the similar factor is there. And so re-operations were done for port site hernia and also the major of a stoma after a laparoscopic APR. So our data suggests that high risk laparoscopic patients have significantly lower post-operative mobility um, as compared to open group and high risk patients have significant shorter length of stay despite this um, idea that perhaps uh, these patients should not go laparoscopy. This is the last bit of my talk, which I will just spend some time on the um, concept of teaching. And I know Alexei uh, mentioned teaching centers and, and, and his interest in teaching. Uh, we look after trainees from the region, so we get senior trainees. We also get fellowships uh, to come to us from UK and overseas. And we have run um, master classes both for national surgeons and international groups. And we have run a national training center as well. This is the uh, 2007 when we started so doing it. Again, if you notice, kind of old stash, uh, basic surgeon used to come in theater and spend some week or so. 
this is a concept uh, which we published uh, a couple of years ago on modular training. If you could train surgeon using what you call a modular training approach. So a, a training doesn't have to do the whole operation. You can divide it into different steps. So the training could do, for example, module one of the left side, which is putting the ports in, patient position, managing the small bar, mobilize the vessel, divide the vessel. And the module two would be the chronic mobilization, doing the transaction of the bowel and doing the joint. So you could almost share the operation between two trainees. So everybody is interested, everybody is focused on their day. And the argument really was that can you train people using this approach? And would it not affect your service delivery? You know, it would affect the clinical outcomes. You're asking trainees to do this operation. So we looked at that. This is word general of scientific presentation, the publication from a couple of years. Um, again, uh, this is the concept. These are the results. 237 cases in two years um, done using the same approach. Trainees performed 96% of right and 99% of the left side having practically modules, uh, four patients, two percent required, three operations, R0 resection rate for cancer 99%, median length of stay was four day and zero post operative mortality. So effectively we demonstrated that it really doesn't matter um, if your trainee does the operation as long as the common denominator is the trainer, they should have the same result. Uh, we took it further now and we looked at uh, a year on following that paper to look at our course of trainees, what they've been doing. So in that year you can see the course of trainees, these are the course of fellows. They did 104 operations, 3% conversion, everything you can see, mobility, length of stay was 4 days. And then we compared it to consultant surgeons coming into our hospital to get trained. So there are two different levels of trainees because the general concept was that if you are older or if you are a senior surgeon, you cannot learn laparoscopy. That's what everybody thought and said. But that was not right. Because then we looked at uh, course of data, and these are NTP trainees, which means they are the people who are coming in national training program to us. They have similar number of cases, and you can see exactly the same results. So it really doesn't matter what age you are, as long as you are trained constructively, you are likely to produce the same result. And that's what the paper sort of suggested. And the conclusion really was that yes, it is possible to do modern training, it's possible to produce similar outcomes. So the next sort of couple of slides really are for the national training program, and perhaps Danilo will talk about it a bit more. So I will sort of skip through it, but just give you sort of this slide, which is a borrowed slide from uh, HAS data. So I think one of my colleagues asked me what proportion of um, selective cancers are done in extensive laparoscopic use just now. And um, this is the data which suggests that last year it has gone up to 36%. This is England, not the UK. So, and then we will talk about this is force of contribution in the NDP and so forth. So what is a perfect training uh, model really? You know, what would you like to call a perfect training model? And the idea really would be, this is what the perfect training model should look like. You know, you should reproduce a, a mini me, you should produce something which is a smaller version of you who will do the same thing. Some might argue that this perhaps is beginner's luck. When you start doing things in the beginning, you always get nature on your side and uh, you get good results. Perhaps this is, uh, this is uh, true for most things. So recently we looked at our five year data. This is just one slide. As I know that I'm running out of time. So I just watched on one slide to give you an idea. Total of 1,422 cases in six years in the year. Converting the visa laparoscopic over at the section. Converting the 2% major mobility requiring re operation. About 2% mortality 0.9%. And everything else as they look. This is the figure from last year, so we are slipping. We need to keep it above 90% rating, which we can. Um, I will sort of skim through this. This is a laparoscopic rectal cancer data outcome from our unit. Yeah, we've got close to 400 now. This is an older slide. And you can see, even in laparoscopic GME data, all of this looks pretty respectable as compared to most published data. So you are able to do this. Uh, other thing which we are doing uh, a lot more now is emergency laparoscopic surgery for obstructive <laughs> and perforative cancers. Um, this is, you, the trend, this is for emergency cancers, more and more and laparoscopically now in the unit. 
Ambassador Dan Open. Yesterday, about the emergency of structuring for a free forum on Cuba. Uh, and you can see that uh, this looks pretty respectable figures for somebody who would do uh, more and more uh, emergency cases. So, really the limitation, so where is the limitation in terms of what you can do and what you can't? I generally believe the limitation is in imagination. So, if you imagine, most things are possible. You know, if you think about this, this would not be possible. But this actually has been done. So, it's the imagination that stops you. So I would conclude by saying that uh, indeed, as uh, somebody who would want to establish a program, a vision in your mind, uh, it is very important to have a vision. It's almost, the way I see it is you need to have what I call three-year and five-year goal. You need to have a mission. Otherwise, there is no point in living. Otherwise, we will all become like vegetables. So you need to have a mission to get somewhere in three to five years. You need to have a vision and then you make sure that you realize what you uh, visualize and then share it with somebody like the director of this institute who is sitting very close to me to keep him on your side. So you need to have the management on your side to make sure that they do the same thing. And I always say that it's better to be lucky than rich because one thing brings the other. I will leave you with this slide to say you should become the change that you want in the world around you. And I thank you for your time.